GE is on a huge journey right now. We are a 128-year-old startup, um, and we are transforming the company. If you walk through what's happened in the last five years under Jeff Emelt's leadership, we're out of the banking business. Uh, we just sold the appliances business to uh, Hire, which is a Chinese manufacturer. Um, we are, we, you know, we sold NBC five years ago. We are now purely a technology company, and we're a technology company that makes the infrastructure that makes the world operate. You know, if you flew here today on a on a commercial aircraft, there's a 55% chance that you were flying in a plane that had GE engines on it. Uh, if you find yourself in a hospital and you have to get some medical imaging done, the likelihood is that it'll be a GE machine that does those uh, uh, imaging for the, you know, the clinicians who are going to be helping you. So we are in just about every mega important industry. Uh, and actually, I think it's a fitting conversation. We'll talk a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing, the, the statement that you had from your founder um, around designing a sustainable world. Um, it's our belief that if we don't get on top of how we use infrastructure as a developing world matures, uh, we're not going to be able to have a very interesting place for all of us to live inside of. So I, what I'm gonna th I thought I'd do is walk you through a little bit about how we see the marketplace so you understand what G's position is on this thing we call the industrial internet or the industrial, um, the internet of really important things. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing from a design perspective to tackle it uh, out of a user experience um, uh, point of view. So we make really big machines. This is the tallest wind turbine in the world. It's about 200 meters off the ground. Uh, this is a field services engineer. We have to write software for this guy, right? That's a different kind of software application than you can imagine. Uh, and we also have to write software that um, enables uh, this particular machine to generate power more effectively. And I'll talk about a story about how we do that uh, in, in a moment. Um, so we're also in this moment, and there's, I'm noticing my Cisco Jabber is showing up in all the screens, but I'm not sure I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, we're in this moment where uh, we're building a platform. And to give you kind of an understanding of why we're building a platform, uh, let's talk about what's gonna happen over the next five years. So we're gonna have 20 billion things join the internet. That's more than phones, that's more than computers, that's all the devices that control different systems, uh, and there's a reason why we need to do that, because we want to get more effective utilization out of those assets. And the reasons are, you know, uh, are very, very uh, strong. So if you look at that, it means massive amounts of data. So a, 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 a Gen X engine, which is one of the newer engines from GE, can generate up to half a terabyte of data per flight. So just do the math and you add that up, there's 22,000 pairs of engines flying around the world at any one time from GE, um, and they're all generating half a terabyte every time they go up and go back down. That's a massive amount of data. And in the past, we could just throw, we had to throw it away because it was just, the volumes were too large. But we're in this moment in computer science where you know, memory is, or compute is fairly inexpensive and memory is close to free, we can actually collect all this information. And with advanced analytics running on that information, we can discern all kinds of interesting behaviors around equipment. So that's kind of the opportunity space um, uh, that we're starting in. Uh, and just to give you some ideas around scale, right? So there's a billion smart meters already out in the world today, uh, providing information back to utilities. They have all kinds of information on them. Uh, we're in this really interesting moment with lighting. Lighting is being reinvented around the world. You know, GE invented the light bulb. Um, we have a very large lighting business. It's been renamed. It's called Current. Uh, they don't sell lighting anymore. They sell outcomes. Uh, and what they're selling is you know, LED with technology in it that enables industrial users, uh, businesses, uh, cities to get more value out of their infrastructure. And I'll give you an example in that case. You know, we're working on a project with the city of San Diego right now where we're relamping the gaslight district with new lighting. And the ROI just by shifting from halide lamps to LED lamps is, you know, will pay off in like two or three years. So there's a reason to do that. But we're not just putting an LED in that light anymore. There's a camera, a vibration detector, a temperature detector, an infrared detector, a uh, noise detector, an environmental quality detector. Because sensors are so inexpensive, we can add that to the light fixture. And we're providing technology with the Predix platform that we have that enables the city to identify open parking spaces, communicate that to the public, 
but also, unfortunately, communicate when you've been in your parking space probably a little too long, and they can send a meter maid to go give you a ticket. So um, there are these use cases that are, are, are evolving out of the fact that sensors are so inexpensive that cloud compute is becoming basically you know, a free kind of substance that is malleable. Um, we have a lot of conversations about connected car. Um, if you look in the last kind of right thing on the side, by 2020, you know, we're going to have 10 to the 6 terabytes just off our own infrastructure. You know, that's an economy in of itself, and the volumes of data are just, just massive. Uh, and we sort of see this world as, as a, new, a new world. So if you think about the last you know, sort of sets of, of technical innovation, we've had sort of the consumer internet, um, and you know, we know all what happened in that, Google with search and, and you know, Facebook and all the kinds of things that we do, systems of engagement. Uh, we've had um, the enterprise IT space, right? So systems of record, uh, ERP systems that have brought uh, tremendous uh, value to organizations, making them more successful. And now we're moving into this sort of systems of assets, systems of machines, and the machine being the centric thing that you actually wrap your business processes around because they're so valuable and because you can get more value out of them. So this is the marketplace that we think that we're entering. Uh, our economists inside of GE think it's a quarter of a trillion dollar business opportunity. Uh, and we believe that there's going to be a huge startup community and lots of other parties, not just GE, in this adventure. We're fairly far ahead in this adventure in comparison to others, but there are just lots of folks, you know, you'll, if you watch what Cisco or Qualcomm or IBM are doing, uh, they're entering into this space as well. So what do I mean by platform? So uh, it's pretty straightforward. You know, we have a device machine on the, on the left um, that uh, generates data. Uh, we collect that data. We also collect data from other kinds of systems. We aggregate that data into a very cloud-centric uh, uh, stack. Uh, we're using Cloud Foundry, which is a tool that comes out of Pivotal Labs. And then we put some secret sauce on top that has to do with industrial environments. So if you imagine in the industrial world, security is a really strong um, uh, issue. You have to be really uh, smart about it. Uh, we add a lot of algorithms. You know, one of the things that's interesting about a data science standpoint, you know, GE has had data science for 75 years. You know, we've been using physics-based algorithms to design product for a long time. Turns out they're great for anomaly detection when you're operating a piece of equipment. But we also use uh, standard statistical and analytic analysis that come out of the data science community. Um, and then um, we enable that through great experience. So we have a very strong perspective on contextually providing people the right information. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Just one story on the wind turbine side. Um, we took the Predix platform last year and with some algorithms attached it to an existing wind farm that we had for Exelon. And just through monitoring the data coming off of each of the turbines, and it was a farm that had I think about 50 uh, wind turbines in it, we were able to tune the wind turbines so that they draft off each other. And this is a concept that makes a lot of sense. You have one turbine, it's collecting the air, and then its, its wake is disturbing the air that's going into the next turbine, the next turbine. And if we could get them all to coordinate with each other, you could get more, you know, more power output. So in that project, we were able to change the power output by about 5% which ended up being 20% to the bottom line of the customer. So it was a huge outcome on an existing asset. They'd already put the money into the infrastructure, and they were able, through software, through analytics, through this kind of cloud platform concept, extract uh, more capability out of the equipment that they have. And that's the promise of the industrial space. And I think that's one of the ways that we're going to be looking at making our world more sustainable. Okay, so it's Predix. Um, you actually can go check it out. Uh, it went uh, globally available, or not globally available, general availability, but available in the US um, last month. Actually, not last month, because today's April 1st, in the middle of February. Uh, it's global in scale. Uh, we're building data centers across the world. There's two in the US right now, one in the UK being built. 
Uh, it allows big data analytics. It's an open ecosystem. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing is uh, there's an opportunity to build applications on top of it, but you can also build services that others can build applications on top of. So if you're familiar with you know, traditional, uh, or not traditional, um, contemporary development techniques, all the kinds of things that you used to be seeing like Mongo or um, uh, Postgres and other types of tools that people are using right now are all built into the platform. And we have a bunch of startups who are actually adding extra capability into it. And the other thing that's interesting about the open ecosystem standpoint is it's not just for GE. So we are trying to develop a platform for our customers. You know, they may have, a gas turbine in a power plant, but it's connected to equipment by other vendors. We want them to be able to have visibility across their entire uh, ecosystem of systems and machines. And so it, the intention of the Predix platform is that it's open even for our competitors to work on top of, which is an interesting idea. And it's also a little bit different than traditional cloud because in the industrial world, we're, we're sort of toying with this idea of calling it industrial computing because it's edge compute, so you have to be able to have uh, analytics happen on, uh, on the edge next to the devices. Sometimes because you don't have connectivity, it's an oil field out in the middle of nowhere, maybe it gets a satellite uplink once a day. Um, you need to have gateway connectivity, the ability to aggregate, let's say a field, do more analytics there, and then you need to bring that all the way up to the cloud to get the advantage of massive compute uh, and analytics. And you have to build that with security across that entire pipeline. So it's a little bit different than, let's say, an Amazon Web Services or other types of cloud players, because it has to consider each of those buckets along the way uh, in the value chain of how machines operate. OK, so uh, open ecosystem. I'll get into talking a little bit more about it. You can learn more about it at this site called predicts.io. Um, IO has a bunch of uh, content in it. You can sign up to become a developer in it. And you know, I was talking to Bjorn maybe about having a hackathon here at some point in the near future where we could showcase and share with you guys you know, how it works. So let's talk a little bit about uh, user experience. So uh, the industrial world is very different than the traditional software world. And it's an area that hasn't had much design focus on it. And the field engineers, people who have been working out and servicing equipment in the field, literally carry briefcases of paper with them um, with manuals, uh, information on how to take something apart. Uh, if they do have a tool, it, it literally might be DOS. I mean, it's that old. Uh, and so it's a completely different environment. People really haven't figured out how to design for them. And we had to go inside of GE's own culture five years ago when we started the software center in San Ramon to change perceptions about the value of design. How could design change how we build software? How could design change the impression of GE as a software company? How could we help users in the industrial space be more successful? So we did a lot of evangelism inside the company. My role still to this date is I spend a lot of time with executives in GE reminding them that design matters. And we think of user experience is this practice of crafting the human touch points of products and services to create useful, meaningful, and delightful experiences for users and business value for the company and our customers as a whole. And this isn't putting lipstick on a pig. This is basically you know, getting deep into contextually understanding what people are doing. We've actually, it's really interesting, we've had to take uh, user experience people on our team and send them to helicopter crash school so that they could go do user research on an oil platform, right? So you know, we've actually had to kind of get ourselves out into the field to learn more about it. Um, the other thing that we talk about a lot in GE is this difference between user interface and user experience. And it gets, especially with engineers, uh, they, the two get conflated as meaning the same thing, but they aren't the same thing. You know, UI is a manifestation of a good experience. Uh, you could have this awesome bike on the left with every part exceedingly well designed, and it's irrelevant for the activity on the right because the right side, you need a different bike. Right, so you know, we've been trying to work inside our own organization around, look, you have to understand the culture who you're designing for. What are the business practices? Are they wearing gloves? Is it a hard, hot and harsh environment? Uh, how do people have to work? You better understand that first before you start making a perfect product. And so that's been a big part of our journey inside of the company and even with our customers about designing, a, um, uh, uh, explaining the value of UX. Um, 
So this is another example we use, so right, the designing the product or designing the experience. Uh, you can argue that the Heinz bottle on the left is an awesome artifact. It's a beautiful bottle. It's part of you know, pop culture, uh, Andy Warhol and all. Uh, on the right, uh, the squeeze bottle that uh, uses gravity to make sure you get all the ketchup out. You know, how is that designed? That was designed by a bunch of people watching American families use ketchup for a long period of time and then prototyping and innovating a product that's more successful. You never can get the ketchup out of a full bottle on the left. On the right, you know, one squeeze and it comes out. Now, you might make an argument that the left is more elegant the one on the right is more useful. In the industrial space, we're always going to take useful over elegant, but we want to do both if we can. Um, the other thing we talk about, and we call this the UX iceberg, uh, and a lot of what people think about user experience is the top of the iceberg. Like, what does it look like? You know, and, and inside GE, I had to spend a lot of time with executives in our last five-year journey talking them down from something that was cool, right? They would go hire an agency and look for something that looked super cool. That would be their kind of description. And there's nothing wrong with that, but appearance is only you know, the top of the iceberg. You really have to understand pieces of the puzzle on, uh, below. And those of you in the UX community or designers in this room will get this, that you have to understand the value. You know, how does it add value to the actual users? Um, you have to understand the capabilities. What does it need to do for people so that they can accomplish their tasks? And, and then the, I think the most important layer in that is behavior, understanding how people work, uh, how you can influence their behavior to change the way that they operate. And we do that in two different directions, right? We start with prototyping on one level, and we uh, start with you know, a lot of user research, sort of understanding how um, the environments that we're operating in inside. And five years ago, I would say GE had a very notional idea of how it was serving industrial users. Uh, and now we have a kind of corpus of research from across all of the different um, uh, businesses that GE is in that is super valuable. We know a lot about how people who work with machines, you know, how they work with them, what they need to do to be successful. We talked a little bit about the, the ROI of design. This is a, if you haven't seen this before, this is a chart that's um, produced by the uh, Design Management Institute. They publish it every year. I think this is for 2014. Uh, and it's there, uh, it, it's actually, you can use it for your stock portfolio if you want to. Um, but it shows that companies that bring design on board outperform their peers. So again, in a very metrics driven culture that I exist in in GE, you know, it's an engineering led culture, getting people to understand that design is material to software engineering and maybe trading off the head count so that you actually have some designers in the room um, might be more important. We had to spend a lot of time with a audience unfamiliar that the, va the value and the outcome of design to be able to be successful at it. One of the things we did discover though along the way, which has benefited us a lot, is that there are some hidden values, right? So uh, improved product and service quality, we all kind of get that, uh, that's important. But on the right, we also delivered faster development time with less cost, uh, more coherent planning, less wasted effort. And we don't start projects anymore in our environment without the design team starting first, which is a huge win. So we go out, we do some contextual research, we do some prototyping, we do some making before we ever get into an agile or scrum or lean startup modality. Um, and the reason why is if you think about lean and agile, if you don't know where you're going, it's just a faster way to get to crappy software, right? And it's a more efficient way to get a bad outcome. Um, it's a great process and a great methodology if you know generally the direction that you're headed. So the trick is if the project is well defined, you can start and in the agile process and UX can be part of it. But if there's a lot of ambiguity about what you're trying to accomplish, then you really need to have design as part of the conversation so to help understand what's possible. And you have this term I call it possibilitarianism. So uh, designers are possibilitarians, right? We, we are the people who have lots of what if and lots of ideas. Uh, and then we converge and we test and we converge and we, you know, and we test along the way. And that action of making, and the, which is so exciting about this site, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to walk around here earlier today to see students you know, making and, uh, and learning, um, is a different way of operating. Uh, in GE's culture, we used to think a lot before we would make anything giant PRD product requirements document, endless meetings, and then we'd have like a month to actually make the thing. What we're trying to do is make the thing. 
So we do prototypes, we're very lean on the requirements, we focus on actually actionable small bits of stuff um, so that we can actually get outcomes and you use the process, the iterative process, uh, to you know, get to the end, end result faster. And design, from our perspective, is a secret sauce in being able to do that successfully. Which kind of goes into the design thinking tri uh, triangle. You may have seen this as a Venn diagram before. Uh, it's really about viability, feasibility, and desirability. GE was really good at the viability, incredibly excellent at the feasibility. Uh, great business model company. Terrible when we started on the journey at actually making things that people wanted to use. Uh, and because the industrial world didn't have a choice, they just got what they got. Um, and now we have actually changed that perception. Uh, I'll give you another quick story. Uh, about three years ago, we got asked by um, GE Marine, they make engine systems for uh, drilling ships. And it's a really odd concept, but the idea is how do you keep a ship from moving in the sea? You know, and that's kind of an impossible thing to do, but that's what they do um, through gyroscopes and through engines. Uh, and they had, uh, you know, they have a user interface for controlling that on the, on the deck of the bridge of the ship. Uh, and they were the, uh, they hadn't sold a solution in three years and they were under a ton of pressure and they tried everything. And the company was actually thinking of selling off the business because it wasn't performing very well. They came to our team, uh, they invested about a million dollars in time and effort. Uh, we went out, put people on drill ships, in drill ship simulators, talked to real mariners, understood the problem, designed a new solution, a new interface, used a whole bunch of really interesting auditory alarm um, uh, user experience concepts, brought it together into a new design system. Didn't actually change the actual code that ran the system. It was just a completely new front end to uh, the technology that actually ran the ship. And we showed it at a naval tech conference in London and they took every single order and they've taken every single order in the industry since then. So they had a $70 million day. On the first day, they showed it to customers. So it tells you the value of design. That story helped us open a lot of doors inside the company to that value because people were like, wow, I want to have that too. So back to the story around uh, design being a leader in this construct, right? So you may have seen this diagram before. We didn't invent this. Um, but this idea of, of identifying the opportunity and sort of describing the solution space before you get into that lean iterative sp cycle uh, is something that we're really testing and trying hard to do. And so this is really about that design thinking conversation, getting business, getting uh, architects and software people, getting the customer, getting the design team together to generate lots of ideas, come up with a great solution before you get into the development process. And then in the development process, you can do all the things that you've heard of in the Lean Startup, pivot, learn, and make, but at least we have this notion of getting closer to the direction we want to head by using design methods. So let's talk a little bit about uh, folks in the uh, industrial space. Um, it's really important for industry, and I think that there's a huge opportunity for us to change how infrastructure is used in the world, uh, provide more optionality in how it's used, but it means that we have to learn a lot more about how people work in that space. So in that space, we have a whole bunch of problems. So user expectations are increasingly set by you know iPhones and Android phones, right? So people who are in the workforce, their, the, their expectation of the software that they want to use, should match their expectations of the consumer software they use when they're not at work. And in the industrial world, that isn't the case. Uh, so there's huge opportunity, but there's also a, you know, an audience that just doesn't understand why you can't get there. Um, it it's gonna change how people work, so you have, to, you have to recognize this. I think one of the things that um, we're realizing is that data literacy and being able to understand information flows, time series, graphs, and charts, uh, being able to make good decisions about the information. These are, these are things that we have to teach this environment. And there may be new roles in industry that arise around people who are good at wrangling data and new skills that emerge around how people collaborate and communicate with each other when they have real-time information. You know, and this is the space that we're trying to head to. You know, don't wait till the business cycle is over to analyze what happened. Analyze what's happening in real time so you can make choices and decisions um, along the way. Uh, 
a big challenge around integration. So data and systems are actually kind of siloed. And one of the value propositions of Predicts, the platform where we're building, is the ability to sort of suck in data from all sorts of different systems, from ERP, from uh, controller systems, from SCADA, from um, uh, you know a variety of different t tools, and try to bring that together. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment in terms of design standpoint. Uh, Industrial people aren't software people, they're tools people, right? And a lot of times they're using both hands to do something. They've got a torque wrench or they're looking at a manual. They're, they're working in, in, in very interesting environments. They may be sort of in a contorted position, you know, servicing a gas turbine, semi upside down with a wrench in their hand. And so we have to think about providing software for them and experiences for them that recognize that they have a limited attention span and a limited ability to interact with those kinds of tools uh, and make it easy for them. And then we also have another big challenge that's happening in the industrial world right now, and this is, has to do with um, some generation gap issues. There are the, most of the domain knowledge in industrial uh, workplace is in the boomer generation that's retiring. And they're walking out of the building with tacit knowledge that's really hard to recreate in the environment. Uh, and then they have, a, and they skipped for some reason, um, a, a, you know, a, a generation in between. And now you have millennials entering the workforce, and there's a disconnect between what people know and the skills that they have. And so one of the things that we're looking at, which is a really interesting idea, is what happens if this guy retires. And he could work four hours a week and be on call from, you know, in his pajamas and his house uh, to uh, assist someone who's operating on a piece of equipment that's 35 years old in Mozambique that someone hasn't really touched in like five years because it was operating fine, but all of a sudden there's a problem. And he was the guy who actually installed it in his career and maintained it. He knows everything about that piece of equipment. So there's some opportunities around um, bridging different folks in the process. Um, and then people are cybersecurity risks themselves, right? So, you know, you plug in a USB stick into a, a machine to download some information off of it. You may have just inserted a virus into it. Uh, it's not primarily a, um, an issue of bad actors. It's mostly an issue of incomplete training or building systems that don't recognize uh, how people interact with them. And it's actually one of the things that's interesting about uh, the cloud and the platform that we're building is that we can actually do a lot of analytics on how people are using and interacting with the system and use that as one of the deterrents for um, uh, bad actors or bad things from happening. Um, and then there's this other piece of the puzzle, which is what happens when we trust the information that we get too much and we don't make good decisions, right? So. Uh, what happens when we depend on it so much that we're not understanding what the background of the information is telling us? And from a user experience standpoint, one of the things that we're very interested in is making sure that the tools we build are not just telling you what to do or telling you what's going on, but they're, you're always learning something in the process. So we have this sort of learning mandate that we build interfaces that make you smarter over time so that you have better decision making. But what does that feel like? What does that make like? I mean, that's, that's something that we, we have to kind of sort out uh, as an industry. So predicts experience, what are we doing with that? So I talked earlier about context. So this is a, a early prototype of predicts experience. It's a card-based model. Uh, in the industrial world, we have this weird opportunity where we can aggregate all the data from all the sources. So from a G perspective, you know, we built the engine, we might have the maintenance contract on the engine, uh, so we know all the parts that are in the engine. If I send a field engineer out, I know, where, I, know I sent him, I know he's sitting in front of the engine, I know the data coming off the engine. Why can't I triangulate all the information that would be useful for that person and in a contextual moment make that content useful for them? So instead of mobile first, we have a term inside of our team, we call it context first. So respect the temporal, respect the location, respect the activity, and then aggregate all the information that you need to be successful and provide only that and nothing else so you don't have to look for it. And we, that's kind of driven us towards a card-based interface. So we have this notion of collections. So you can create cards for different types of activities that you might need to do. Um, and we're building into the platform this whole location awareness construct so that uh, in the industrial world, whatever you need to be interacting with, everything you need is there. You don't have to have 25 different applications. You need just one application. 
And it's kind of similar to if you think about your Facebook feed, right? In Facebook, they use a bunch of algorithms to decide whose posts to put on the top. Uh, you know, we're going to move into this experience where we're going to have algorithms decide what content to showcase to you based on what you're doing. So what does that look like now? So we've, um, in the process, this is a, it's probably an eye chart up there, but um, this is kind of a description of, of a Pritix application. Uh, we're going to open source this uh, UI framework. Uh, it's built on top of um, Google's, um, now I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, I'll think of it in a second, uh, UI framework. Uh, it's really lightweight, very clean, very organized towards data uh, and information. Uh, kind of give you a couple pictures of some of the things that we're doing. Uh, and again, we're trying to build interface like it's a newspaper. So you get, you know, you, if you, how many people here get a, like a news read at the beginning of their day that kind of aggregates news, right? Like New York Times or Huffington Post, et cetera. So this is this concept of sort of organizing your content into a feeds. Uh, and using cards to be able to do that and making the asset, the machine, the center of attention. So you can sort through, you find a machine, you get to decide what you want to do. And then we've decided, you know, intentionally de uh, designed the system so that uh, we can do it at scale, desktop all the way down to a mobile phone. Uh, and the idea there is that we have some ubiquity in terms of devices that people get to choose from. Um, one other side note, just working in a company the size of GE, the design system that we built for GE in of itself saved the company probably about $50 million. Um, and the reason behind that is that there were all these development teams using all these different UI frameworks, um, and none of them were very good at using those frameworks. Uh, when we built a very concise, clean, lean, purpose-built framework for our user base, we were able to accelerate development to such an extent that you could do the math. Um, there was a huge performance gains in terms of the quality and, and, and the ability for teams to execute on projects. So a couple more pictures. Um, we also have a cool space in San Ramon. Uh, and uh, at some point, we'll probably have a tour for you guys have to come out and take a look. This is our immersive environment. Uh, Bill Rue, who's the CEO of GE Digital, calls it the holodeck. Um, we can do 270 degree video, and we have a, a, we have a GoPro camera that shoots 360 degree video. And we can take a research team and go out to an industrial site, shoot video, and then come back and bring that experience back to our research teams. Because we can't send everyone uh, out on the field, but we want everyone to have empathy for who we're designing for and to also understand the context of what we're operating in. So we've used this environment uh, very successfully to explain how rail yards work, uh, how industrial plants work, what happens inside a power plant control room. And we can do it at close to human scale, which is really nice. It's very visceral and being able to do it. We have a design center in San Ramon um, where we take this sort of design first approach, bring teams in uh, to do work. It's a little bit uh, like D school or here on steroids. Um, for instance, these walls actually move. Um, the big walls are on track so we can make the rim smaller or bigger. Um, so it shows you kind of the environment space that we've created for our environment. So the thing that's been fun as a designer is that there's been huge commitment by the company to do design well. We've got a great team. We're always looking for people. So if you're an interaction designer or a researcher and you're looking for work, uh, there's a great opportunity to join a really, really strong design team just here in the East Bay in San Ramon. Uh, and there's lots of other opportunities outside uh, the environment, and that's it. Thanks.